Tim's got a presentation which will take, I think, the best part of an hour. And we will hold questions back until after that, when we will have a short break and then a Q&A session, which I will share. Okay. Kevin. Thank you very much for that kind of introduction. You may not be clapping at the end. Um, so I've got a set of slides here, which I, I, I stood at the back. Can, can you see them okay at the back? Yeah. That's good looking to your eyes, certainly better than mine then. Um, so um, I've called this talk here, get, Getting Off a Moving Train. And I'm, that's really sort of a metaphor, and analogy to think we were on a train that set off in, at least it set off in 1990. We knew it was setting off in 1990. We were at the station when we first started to understand the real implications of climate change. We've had a whole history of climate change before that, going right back to Fourier in 1827, looking at issues of climate change. But we really started to understand how severe it was in the late eight, uh, eight, uh, 1980s and 1990, when the first major report came out from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and the train set off from the station. And what I'm going to be demonstrating here, that we've done nothing at all to try and stop that train. It's just got faster and faster. And the faster it gets, the more painful it is to get off it. And now, we're going to, have, we're going to break some bones. It's not going to, you know, we're not going to do very well when we try and get off this train of, of high emissions. So that's the sort of analogy behind this. And I'm focusing in here today on, um, on energy, energy emissions, which are about uh, somewhere around about 75% of the warming that we see come from the burning of fossil fuels. The other 20 to 25% come from agriculture, from, from production of food. And there are different gases, mostly methane and nitrous oxide, as, as it's carbon dioxide that comes from the energy. Uh, I'm not going to focus on the agricultural side. It's not my area of expertise. I work with other people that, that work in that area. We can eliminate, we can, uh, uh, we can reduce the amount of emissions from agriculture by changing our diets, by changing our agricultural practices, but we cannot eliminate them. You cannot get rid of all the methane and nitrous oxide, even if we all went organic fertilizer, you couldn't do that. And, and even if we all went vegan, you still couldn't do that. There would still be a lot of emissions from agriculture. And I'll come back to that later, because that says something about our energy system, about how much more severe the cuts need to be in energy, because you cannot eliminate all of the emissions from agriculture. And for those of you that, uh, that, use, that use modern forms of social media, I have a, uh, a Twitter account up there. Um, there's the, this one here. Kevin, at Kevin Climate, if you happen to use Twitter, I use it a lot. I only use it for work. I don't do anything. I don't post anything about what I'm up to at the weekends. It's just a work. <laughs> a lot of people put all sorts of things on there and did it all. <laughs> um, so just a work one. So I'm going to start off by evoking the spirit of JFK. Um, and given that the, I'm not being rude here, but the average age of this audience is slightly higher than the students I sometimes teach. <laughs> you probably know who JFK was. Um, I have to explain who he was to school people. Um, and it's, it's, it, the question we really should be asking is, is not what, um, what can the UK do to reduce its emissions? That's not the question we need to ask. And in typical JFK mode, it's more um, what total emission reductions does Paris require of the UK? We signed up to the Paris Agreement. I assume we weren't lying. And therefore, it's not about what we think we can do. It's what we need to do to deliver on Paris. And that's a very different framing. I think we need to turn that around. Don't sign things and commit to things unless we think we can deliver on them. And once we have signed them, then let's deliver on them. And so I, tell you, I start from that position, which is a very different position from, from that a lot of other policymakers and indeed lots of academics start from. So I want them to think about um, a couple of emergencies that we've all lived through. Um, again, many of my students, well, banking crisis, I can't remember what that was. Because um, it was, you know, it was a while ago now. But the banking crisis, 2006, just before we had the banking crisis, and I think most people would have said then that you couldn't imagine having rapid social change. That would be impossible. You couldn't drive rapid shifts overnight in, in how we, how we ran our society, how we ran our economy. And yet, in 2007, we had the subprime mortgage scandal, the Lehman Brothers triggering it in the U.S. And um, then we had in 2008, we already started this. What was a decade of austerity? And playing out, particularly hitting the, the poorest communities um, and the people in the most vulnerable jobs. So a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of cuts in public services, huge cuts in public services, huge cuts in the, in the budgets for councils and, and all the other things that they, they provide. Massive job insecurity, sort of the introduction of zero hours contracts came out of all of this. Um, and uh, very much uh, social upheaval, as I've put it out there. Can, can you still read the text at the back? Yeah. yeah. God. Well, I think I need to go to Spectators. 
what we call the independent version. Um, we also had quantitative easing, huge amount of quantitative easing, where we, the, the, the uh, Chancellor pumped massive amounts of public money into the private sector to try to, to stimulate the economy, um, somewhere in the region of half a trillion pounds. So um, some people think it's more than that. But somewhere between a, a quarter and half of our GDP was pumped from the public purse into the private purse. Unfortunately, it wasn't done to try and improve any sort of greening of our society, which it could have done, which is exactly what the Koreans did and others did, but not, not in the UK. So what we, what we did, we went from the impossible to the, to the actually delivered in two years. So we, we, can, we can bring about rapid change. That example demonstrates that. And then move on a few more years, one more familiar with and we've still escaped from, was the COVID tragedy, which we're still living with or dying with at the moment. Um, 2019, again, the view was often had when we talked about climate change and other big things. You can't have rapid social change. And yet, overnight, we had the COVID crisis that triggered a global social change. When you think about what that was, I mean, people locked down in their homes. You know, some, you know, some people argue, basically, some of the film in, in, in China, people were welded into their houses because they had metal, metal doors that were welded shut. Um, you look at what happened in Italy, people couldn't leave their, their high rise blocks of flats. There was, it was you know, incredible the sort of level of social change that we saw and accepted overnight. And, but again, who was hit most by that? I mean, we were all hit by it, but certainly the poor were key workers were really hit very hard, particularly people of colour in this country, for a whole suite of reasons why that was the case. Um, and I think that's interesting because um, that, I'll come back to that right at the end, I think it's something about how we value people in our society. But again, we went from the, from the impossible to the delivered in two years. I'm going to come back to how we responded to those two emergencies later on and see how we responded to the climate emergency. But we also saw lots of emission cuts with COVID. So huge reductions in emissions. Globally, emissions went down by about between, well, probably about four and a half to five percent is the latest estimate. Um, so that's a reasonable reduction in emissions, given the emissions have been going up pretty much every year, other than the September the 11th and the banking crisis, when there were little dips. But and this is the biggest reduction we've seen for many, many years. Um, and the level, C, level of CO2 uh, uh, cuts, if that kept on, if, if that level of cut kept on year after year from now, we, we'd be somewhere around about two degrees centigrade of warming which was our original goal. That's about the level of war we would have if we had that level of cut in emissions every year. So just think how severe the changes have been in our, life, in our lifestyles over the COVID period. And the reduction of emissions from that, what we'd have to do every single year, year on year, for at least a couple of decades. And that would just about hold us to about two degrees centigrade of warming. It gives us something in our minds to think about, well, how big are these changes have to be? Not for one year, for a couple of decades of that, that sort of reduction. And that wouldn't hold you to 1.5 degrees centigrade, that would be an outside chance of 2 degrees centigrade. So what lessons have we learned um, uh, from COVID in relation to climate change? I think the, the signs aren't good. What we've seen is uh, the poorest and wealthiest countries now again seeking economic growth. So no real shift there from what we were aspiring to before. More energy, more resources, and, and more emissions, and this whole language you'll hear sometimes in the press from journalists who don't bother to understand what's going on properly, and also I would argue a lot of co-opted academics, I think it's particularly senior ones often, this language of decoupling, that we've moved emissions away from growth, is rubbish. What we've done is we've moved our production abroad, and then we buy in the products, and then we blame them for the high emissions. So we have, our lifestyles are still incredibly rich, high carbon lifestyles today. So this language of decoupling is a myth at the moment. It has not been experienced anywhere. Some very marginal adjustments, but no significant decoupling. And because economic growth um, is to be welcomed in poor parts of the world, in many poor parts of the world, we want to see them have economic growth because that does improve their well-being. But do we need to see it in the UK, the EU, in the US? Are these many parts of the world we want to see ongoing, forever economic growth from around the planet with finite resources? Or is there some point where we think, actually, probably enough is enough and we have to learn how to distribute it and use it more wisely. So <clears throat> the science aren't good on this. So a little bit of science here. Is this my one? Yeah. You don't often get beers when you go to give a talk. You need the beer for science. Yeah, it makes you more lucid, not fall over. Um, so a little bit of science here, and it's really a flippant view of the science. The climate does not respond, and you already made this point in the, in the opening comments, it doesn't respond to good intentions, to Machiavellian policies, which we're awash with. 
um, to eloquent arguments, to legal niceties, and to accountancy scams. And in, in accountancy scams, I call include net zero 2050, which mm -hmm. some of you may have heard about. That's the framing for the UK. Indeed, almost every country in the world now has got some mythical net zero target by some random date in the future, and almost nothing behind it. All of these things are trumped by the brutal beauty of the physics. Yeah. It doesn't care about our scans. It sees through it every time. The only reason the temperature goes up is because it looks down, it sees the CO2 molecules, and it raises the temperature, and the other greenhouse gases. All of this other stuff is just hot air and nonsense. So what really matters is the total amount of carbon dioxide we put in the atmosphere. That's what the physics tells us, and other greenhouse gases. That's what matters in terms of temperature, and therefore in terms of impacts. And so the rest of it is just fluff and nonsense. Um, now in 2015, the end of 2015, we had the Paris Agreement, um, which we signed, and the Paris Agreement, um, which we which were all, pretty much all, all countries, I think about four or five of them, small countries were signatures to the Paris Agreement, and we agreed to cut emissions in line with holding the rise in temperature to no more well below 2 degrees centigrade of warming, and ideally aiming for 1.5, to do this in accordance with the best science and also on the basis of equity. And that, the equity part there makes the difference between the rich countries reducing their emissions much faster than the poor parts of the world and moving away from fossil fuels much faster than the poor parts of the world. Um, and I'm going to focus here on the 1.5 degree centigrade of warming. And I'll come back to that in a minute because it doesn't sound like very much on a, on a chilly evening in, in the world. You think 1.5 warming? It sounds quite a nice thing to have. Bring it on. Um, so what the after the Paris Agreement and this this 1.5 degrees C framing, which was quite a surprise to many of us that that came in there. And it's about the first time ever, I think, that the global community in these negotiations had taken any notice of the poor countries. But the poor countries came together and argued very strongly that 1.5 was, was about the most they could cope with. And in the in order to turn about, the policymakers then have asked the scientists, well, what are the impacts of 1.5? You would normally expect to ask that first and then come up with a policy. But in this case, it's the other way around. Um, so the scientists were asked the, uh, in the inter Intergovernmental Panel, Panel for Climate Change, which is the UN body that brings together all the scientists on these issues every few years, asked to look at, um, sort of specially look at the impacts of 1.5 and 2 degrees centigrade. And they, this is the report that they came out with, um, SR 1.5, Special Report 1.5. Um, and in summary, and it's, it's a big report, there's a lot of work in there, a huge amount, but in summary, what it's saying there is that the impacts for even 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming are severe on ecosystems, on human systems, on agriculture, on the physical infrastructure of the, of the places that we live. So they're not without significant impacts. And we start to see some of those impacts playing out around the world now. Um, more floods, more droughts, um, you know, more severe weather conditions, more extinctions, more human migration. It feeds into all of these things. Uh, and that sounds pretty bad, but they're much less than the impacts at 2 degrees centigrade. And just to give a feel, and all, none of these things are good. There's not, there's a, there's a, this is not an upbeat talk. There are no nice silver linings in this. There are things we can do, and I'll come back to them towards the end, but they're not, they're not easy. Um, if you think about something like the Barrier Reef, a sort of a, an emblematic ecosystem, at one and a half degrees centigrade, we wipe out about 75% of the Barrier Reef, and not just the Barrier Reef, virtually all tropical corals. At two degrees centigrade, according to the report, we wipe out virtually all tropical corals around the world. So it's quite an achievement in really what is about 50 to 70 years of missions really. That we managed to do something so destructive. Um, and so the argument then was, well, we should aim really for 1.5 rather than 2 degrees centigrade. And in fact, I was being talking to colleagues who work on Greenland recently, and the news from Greenland is much, much worse. Um, even if we stopped the emissions now, when, and that would mean the temperature could very quickly stop going up, the level of water melt will continue. Once we've triggered those effects in Greenland, Particularly Greenland, much more than Antarctica. Antarctica plays out after 2100. Greenland plays out this century. And the experts in Greenland, would, would, and many of them will say that we expect to see a metre, and we wouldn't even be surprised if it got as high as two. Now, let's hope it's nothing like that. But they think a metre is almost inevitable, because the rate of melt on Greenland, even with just 1.1 degree centigrade of warming, is far higher than they anticipated. The actual empirical evidence, the actual melt they're getting today, it's melting so much faster than they expected. There's a whole new, new set of mechanisms as to why that's the case. And some of them are really fascinating, but also very disturbing. So we had this report, and that led in various you know, parts of the world, all the, all the devolved administrations in the UK, the EU, and many other parts of the world, including institutions and uh, companies and councils, to declare climate emergencies. So these are everywhere, these climate emergencies. 
And then in 2021, earlier this year, in May of this year, the, the um, environmental leaders of the G7 came together. Actually, they came together virtually for the first time ever. They always fly around the world to meet each other. This time it was a virtual engagement, but mostly driven by COVID, not by climate change emissions. Um, they came together and they reinforced the commitment on 1.5. So we have this very strong commitment on staying to 1.5. But I think it's worth pointing out that even at 1 degree C, well, we're about 1.1 degree centigrade warmer now than we were at the, before we started burning fossil fuels, the pre-industrial period, as they call it. So about 1850 to 1870, we're about 1.1 degrees warmer. And just to give a feel for that, in the previous 10,000 years, going way, way back, before the Egyptians, right way back, in modern human times, we have never seen anything more than about 1 degree centigrade of warming. So we have, all of our infrastructure, all of our cultures have evolved um, within a stable climate. We have never lived as humans, in modern humans, we have not lived through an unstable climate. Everything about our infrastructure and our cultures and our agriculture. So this is quite, you know, when you look at what we're playing at now, overnight we're talking about a radically different climate and we have no history of that, of how that works. But even at 1.5 degrees, 1.1 degrees centigrade of warming, what we're seeing are poor people around the world impacted already by climate change. And these people are typically people of colour, typically people who are low emitters, much less influenced financially, and not being part of the problem really in any way. And these people are really suffering already today from climate change. So it's not a problem about the future, it's a problem about the present for these communities. But their voices are almost never heard. These voices were hardly ever heard in, in, in Glasgow. As I said before, it would affect the uh, ecosystems. And think about that. Some people think, well, that doesn't, does it really matter if we live with a few polar bears and so forth? But remember, ecosystems are very complex, and we rely on them. Um, if, it, if it wasn't for the insects pollinating our crops, we'd starve. And we already see changes in pollinating insects as a consequence of a whole load of reasons of which climate change is one. So we are, we, are changing, we are changing the world in which our own children, and our children's children, will have to live <coughs> for decades, centuries, and probably thousands of years. So we have to recognise the emissions we're putting in the atmosphere today are already causing suffering and already killing people elsewhere. We, you know, that's something we know, and we have known for 30 years that would be the case, and we've just carried on, carried on expanding airports and building more roads, buying more stuff, even though we know that other people elsewhere in the world will suffer the impacts, and so indeed will our own children. And we haven't changed our behaviour, which does say something about our cultural structures. And it's obviously not just the UK, it's all over the world. It's obviously the wealthy parts of the world. So I now want to focus on mitigation, which is a posh word for reducing our emissions. And I'm, I'm going to focus mostly on the energy system. <coughs> so. so how are we doing? So we know how big the problem is, and we've known that for a long time. So how are we actually doing in terms of reducing our emissions? <coughs> well, the, the, um, my, my generation, and that means in this case, most of us here, I think, are in this category. I'm sorry, sorry for that, but anyway, um, we need a bit of humility, really. This is the first IPCC report. It came out in 1990, 31 years ago. That's before the parents of the students that I teach, their parents that I hadn't even met. And so to think that for 31 years, we've known everything we needed to know about climate change, and we've chosen to do nothing. That's, I think that's quite a damning indictment about something about our culture. I think maybe it's more than that, maybe it's our psychology, maybe we're hardwired to not to address these issues. But something there means we haven't done anything. 1992, we had, uh, this is 1990, 1992 at the, the Rio Earth Summit, that some of you might remember, a really big, hopeful event in Rio. And we had the follow-up of it um, about 20 years later, just recently. But in 2021, the emissions globally are 60% higher, 62% I think now, higher than they were in 1990, 62% more now than they were in 1990. And they're still going up. It's not as if they're stopping. They're still going up today. So we promised to do something about it in 1990. And 31 years later, our emissions are still going up. So we've had 31 years of abject failure. And that's not to say some people haven't tried. People have tried. But we have to, I think we have to stand back and say what we've done hasn't succeeded. I mean, nothing like it. I mean, it couldn't have gone worse. In fact, the emissions since 1990 today, to, the, to today are higher than from 1990 right through the past of all human history. So we had this science report, and what we did manage to do, we managed to emit more than we have managed to do throughout the whole of human history before that. And it's been going up, the rate of increase until the banking crisis was actually going up. So at every single level, we have to, in a quantitative measure, we have failed. 
And unfortunately, you know, a lot of academic colleagues don't like saying that, but we need to be honest about the position we're in, otherwise we can't solve it. But oddly enough, every country in the world has succeeded, including, of course, the old colonial blighty. Um, and we, we, we're in leadership on climate change, so don't worry about it. You know, we, we're showing the way forward. We've reduced our emissions by 51% since 1990. Um, and even if you go before COVID, we've often said 44% reduction in the UK. We're leading the way forward. But we have to exclude aviation and shipping from those emissions. Um, but the climate does it also sees the emissions from our planes and our ships. And it excludes our imports and exports. So if you put those into the, into the equation, then what we've seen is a 15% reduction since 1990. It's less than half a percent every single year. And I would argue quite a lot of that has come about through other things like the banking crisis, um, like the closure of coal because of the sulfur emissions that were driven by the EU, not because the climate emissions. You know, some, some climate legislation is starting to play out now. I think it's starting to become important. But the big reduction we've seen so far, that 15%, which is hardly anything, hasn't all been through judicious climate change policy. Far from it. But that's true for every so-called progressive country. Sweden, Denmark, on Denmark and the news there recently, they all think they're doing really well. Denmark's emissions haven't gone down since 1990. Not their overall carbon footprint. They ramble on about lots of wind turbines and then they imagine merrily fly all over the world. So when you look at the whole picture for Denmark, no reduction since 1990. So there's true, there are no progressive examples around the world. If you want to look for examples on climate change, you probably have to look somewhere like Costa Rica that's doing a much better job than we are, and maybe even Cuba. And just to demonstrate how bad this is, this is the government. The government's got own oil and gas authority. This is a, a, an agency of, of base or government department. If you look at their website and their Twitter account, what it says on there is that we regulate. So this, this is the organisation that looks after UK oil and gas. We regulate the UK oil and gas industry to maximise economic recovery and support the commitment to reach net zero emissions by 2050. Yeah, an oxymoron, or perhaps a moron, would be more appropriate, um, if ever there was one. So you know, that demonstrates really the, sort of the lie that net zero is. Anything convicted net zero, even maximising our offshore oil and gas resources. And what do we see that goes alongside that? This is the, um, the BP Clay Ridge platform. These are the sort of things that I used to design and, and, and worked offshore in the North Sea on, actually. So I had, a, I had a history for quite a long time working on these, and, and some on land as well. In, in fact, the point of air gas turned on not far from here. I was one of the commissioning engineers on that. And so, you know, these sorts of structures, this is the recent one, the BP one, over its life is expected to emit a quarter of a billion tonnes of CO2. We've got the Glengorn gas field. Governments are enthusiastic about this, 100 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. We've got a, a development in East Yorkshire, which is around another 13 million tonnes. And then we've got a huge development in Mozambique, um, where the UK government is pumping in £1 billion pounds of taxpayers' money to support Total, the big oil company, um, to develop a gas field, which 95% of which is for export. It's not for Mozambicans. It's not as if we care about Mozambique. I mean, this is going on in a civil war at the moment. And we're, we're pumping a billion pounds of UK money in there so that we get some sort of say in what happens to the, to the liquefied natural gas from this facility. Four billion tonnes of CO2 from that facility, according to Total's um, estimates. That's totally all coming. And that whole lie about net zero is reinforced. What else are we doing? We've got a whole programme of airport expansions. Now we're involved in some of the legal cases, uh, putting the scientific evidence in about the post of these. And indeed, the one on um, judicial review two weeks from today, I think it is, um, on the Mozambique expansion as well. So on um, airports, we're expanding these airports, standing Stansted Airport, we put £27 billion in new roads, that's the chance they're putting that in. Um, we're even considering a new coal mine in Cumbria. It's, it's really hard to, and, and, and arguments are made, what's well, methodological coal, it's making steel, you know, all this sort of, every excuse under the sun is dragged out for why we can still do these things. And then we've got enthusiasm by the government for the new Shetland oil find, uh, the Cambo field. To the Scottish Government's almost credit, um, Nicola Sturgeon has said so far that she's uncertain whether we should go ahead with it, as, un, as, as um, our, our incumbent is enthusiastic about getting more oil and gas out of the ground. Um, and all of these, of course, fit with net zero. So all of this fits with this net zero 2050. So no matter what you want to do, you can squeeze it into net zero. It's a scam, but it's everywhere, absolutely everywhere. It wasn't there a few years ago. But I'll come back to that again in a minute. So what would a real response to climate change look like? Well, we haven't seen anything like it. We've seen no sweeping and rapid social change like we saw with COVID or the banking crisis. 
we've seen no immediate and, and, and widespread penetration of low carbon technologies. We've seen some renewable energy plus more oil, gas, and possibly even coal. We've seen some electric vehicles, but we're selling more SUVs than we are EVs. So more than big, you know, ego things that some people seem to like to drive around in four wheel drive cars. Um, we've seen some improvements in efficiency, but we've actually seen more consumption, and that's historically what we tend to see with more efficiency, we've seen more consumption. It's called the Jevons Paradox. There's a whole history of this going right back to Jevons' work on coal years ago. You make the use of coal more efficient, people use more coal. So unless you've got other policies to stop that, almost efficiency, efficiency almost always means more consumption. And that's, efficiency is a good thing, but you need the policies to stop the more consumption. Um, so net zero, in my view, is really a, um, a way of framing incremental change to business as usual. It's not a way of addressing these challenges seriously. And yet it's everywhere. You go to the COP, everything is net zero. Uh, have you ever heard of the Committee on Climate Change? Mm -hmm. Some have. Because the government supply, they want to claim independent. In my view, they're not independent at all. Set up by government, paid by government to give advice to government. Good people, but very politically oriented. Um, the Committee on Climate Change's fifth budget report in 2015 didn't mention net zero once. Its sixth budget report in 2020 uh, mentioned net zero between 3,000 and 5,000 times. So you just bring in a new term and you mention it lots of times and it becomes normalised. People think it means something. It's just another empty expression. Saudi Arabia is net zero. Shell and BP are going to be net zero. You know, anyone could be net zero. Um, so, so you see it in Glasgow, everywhere, every poster was net zero. So away from that sort of rhetoric and nonsense, which I say the climate sees straight through, what does the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tell us from the science about Paris and the G7? That's the Victorian Alba up in um, Dundee. If you've never been there, good train service, go up to Dundee. It's actually an amazing building, really beautiful. We were talking there just recently for the Design Council. So, um, so what do the IPCC say? These are the last three main reports that the IPCC. Assessment Report 5, SR 1.5 and Assessment Report 6, which just came out earlier this year. And what they say, and I'm, oh, there's a huge reports with lots of work behind them as well, and I'm summarising it here as one line. It's, it's carbon budgets that matter. It's the total amount of carbon dioxide put in the atmosphere, not some random date in the future. So that's what matters for temperature, it's the total amount of CO2 put in the atmosphere. So think of it this way, you can see on this, this plot here. It's the area under the curve that matters. And so if in the short term we expand Leeds and Stanton Airport, possibly Gatwick and the other airports. We build 27 billion pounds new roads, we open Cambo gas field, uh, oil field. Then you have to, somewhere, you've got to suck more CO2 out of the, air, out of the atmosphere or, you know, or mitigate even further in the future, which I would argue is impossible. I'll try and demonstrate that as I go through here. So that's what the carbon budget framing is. It tells you the process. The most important period for, for carbon budgets is between now and 2030. And the closer it is to now, is the more important it is, because our emissions are so high, we've got to get off that emission curve so rapidly. So if you look at the latest AR6 report, and you don't expect to see all these numbers, but what it gives you there, it gives you for 1.5 degree centigrade of warming, so if you want to stay at 1.5, it tells you how much carbon dioxide you can dump in the atmosphere for that temperature. For, for a good, and it gives you a probability, a good chance, for, so a reasonably good chance of staying not, not, not going above 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming, then we can dump in the atmosphere around about 400 billion tonnes of CO2, which probably doesn't mean a lot to many of you, but I'll come back to that in a minute. But if you want a low chance of, of 1.5, then you can dump into the atmosphere 650 billion tonnes. Now, given we know how dangerous this is, imagine if, you're, if you were getting on a plane, or your children were getting on a plane, or your grandchildren were to get on a plane, would you accept that level for landing? 66% chance it will land, the all planes land, that they might land in a big heap. And so would you accept a 66% chance that it landed safely? Would that be reasonable for you? Probably not. So you probably wouldn't get on it, would you? You probably wouldn't put your grandkids on it or your kids on it. But that's what we're doing here. But this is, this is only the planet by 8 billion this year. So we're still using these sort of strange probabilities to say, well, a 66% chance of staying below 1.5, that's acceptable. But anyway, if we did that, and the, remember these budgets are for 2020, we're in 2022, then um, if you update it all to the latest numbers for energy only from, from, for January, then we have, a, from one and a half degrees centigrade of warming, we have about 270 to 520 billion tonnes. 270 billion tonnes for a good chance, 570 for an outside chance. 
Now, there's some uncertainty on that, like they're always in all this sort of you know, big science like this, it could be a bit bigger, it could be a bit smaller, but that gives us some sort of idea of how much CO2 we can put in the atmosphere. That probably doesn't mean much to us now, except for the fact we do know we're putting 36 billion tonnes into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels every year. And next year it'll be a little bit more than that, and if you add in land use and deforestation, it's about 42 billion tonnes. So you can quickly do some calculations and say we have 8 to 14 years of current emissions before we blow the budget, even the outside chance of 1.5 degrees centigrade. So it tells us quite a lot about how fast we've got to do something. And remember, emissions are going up now, they're not going down. This year they'll be higher than they were last year, and probably slightly higher maybe than 2019. Next year will be higher again. There's nothing to suggest emissions will come down in the next year or two, unless we have another pandemic or another banking crisis. So what we have is a global pie, a good northern pie. Um, and we know how much CO2 we can dump in the atmosphere, and how big that pie is, we want to divide that pie up between every part of the world. But we signed up in Paris, and every negotiation going right the way back to 1992, and the big Rio site, we've always said that the poorer countries should get a larger slice proportionally to allow them to develop and grow and become more prosperous, because the wealthy parts of the world have caused the problem, and we're already wealthy and prosperous. And so the equity part was key in that. So we follow the language of the Paris Agreement. We have these two groups, developed country parties, or developing country parties, poorer countries, and developed country parties, the wealthy countries. And it, that's the division in the Paris Agreement. And it's true to say that in the developing one, it does include China. And China is obviously a, quite a wealthy country, but its wealth per person is nothing like ours. I mean, it's a, it's a small fraction of ours, and much smaller fraction of the typical wealthy country of the USA and so forth. So China is still, if you look at its human development index, you look at its posting power parity per capita, it, it's still in all those indicators, it's a, it's a poor country. It's not as poor as Rwanda or Kenya or Nigeria, but it's still nothing like as wealthy as the wealthy parts of the world. <coughs> so that's the division in, in the Paris Agreement. And what we did in the paper, my colleagues and I, the Tyndall Centre and some Swedish colleagues um, did, uh, they came out last year actually. We, we looked at this and said, well, if you were to split the pie up on the basis of these equity criteria, how big would the use slice be for the developed countries? Remember, that only 20% of the world's population live in the developed countries. 80% live in the developing countries. So there's a big population difference. So how big should our slice be? And there's lots of ways you can split it up. And we didn't just come up with one slice, we came up with a range of slices. And then, um, oh, I'll just, just put that out these, these are new plots. Probably quite hard for you to see, actually, even at the back. Um, so these, these are some plots just produced for Glasgow um, for a sort of smaller event. Just to give some, you can see, I'll try and just point the big bits out. So the, this is amount of carbon dioxide, this is the number of years. This orange line is in what's called the developing countries, and the blue line is the developed countries. Now, that it, and this is how fast we have to reduce our emissions. Now, it looks a bit unfair on us because they've got more space than we have. But remember, 80% of the population live here, and they're growing their population in the poor parts of the world, as we're not growing it much in the developed parts of the world. And that we often complain about that, but if you look at China, if China's emission, China's population density, number of people per square kilometre, I think it's one quarter of that of England. So, you know, it's not as if these places are, are dense in population either. The, the most dense places are places like Europe. So it's still, there's got plenty of scope for growth, growing populations in the poor parts of the world. If you look at this, then um, the emissions here go to zero by about 2030, 2030, 2031. You know, eight to 10 years from now for energy emissions to be zero for a good chance of 1.5 degrees centigrade. And if you want that, if you have an outside chance of 1.5 degrees centigrade, it gives you an extra five years. So 2035. Zero carbon energy, planes, trains, ships, industry, cars, everything, zero carbon. Sounds impossible, but that's what happens when we've lied to ourselves and everyone else for 31 years. You know, it's a cumulative problem. Every year we lie to ourselves and others, next year gets harder and harder and harder. And 31 years on, it's getting harder still. So the train now is rocketing because we haven't been honest that it's getting faster and faster. And that's why I say to get off now, that's going to hurt. And I'll come back to that later because there's some equity issues associated with that as well. So we then ask the question, of the developed country slice, how much should, should we get? How much should the UK get? And again, there are ways you can divide that out in the population or your recent emissions and your, your ability to, uh, uh, your scope of more renewables, that sort of thing. So there's lots of ways you can do that. And very provisionally, our estimates are that the UK can emit somewhere between three quarters and two and a half billion tonnes. It could be a bit more than that, a bit less. And that again probably means very little to you. But we currently emit, including aviation, 
heading up towards 400 million tonnes. So that's very approximately two to six years of current emissions in the UK. And that's just blown our contribution to 1.5, our fair contribution. And when did you hear that? Has the press ever told us that? This is, all this is, is taking the headline numbers from the well-accepted Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and doing some maths. That's all it is. And in fact, it's not even complicated maths. Most of it is just arithmetic. And get results we don't like. So we have to, we have to find ways out of that. We have to, if, if we're going to call it a climate emergency, let's respond as if it's a climate emergency, mm -hmm. like we responded to the other recent emergencies recently, but we've seen nothing like that. And that means we need to be zero carbon energy by 2030 to 2035. That should be the principal focus of every single policy we're putting in place now, with equity also at its core. That's immediate and profound system change. And there's, there's nothing about that world, you know, that is radically different from the world we live in today. And probably none of us here can remember rationing, which was, no, 1954, anyone remember 1954? Yeah. There was a few, yeah. that was when rationing was stopped, wasn't it? So it started in 1939, stopped in 1954. I think that's right. I think it started in 1939, stopped in 1954. But they, they gradually picked it out to the final things were taken off in 1954. So this is, this is a rationing world. You know, this is, we've got a carbon budget to live in. We've got, you know, that is innately irrational. There's no neat way we can describe it as fair shares or whatever. But it's the same thing as rationing. We just don't like to use that word a lot. Particularly Americans hate when engaged with them. They hate the idea of using that word. But that's what it is. So why is this so different to net zero? Oop. That's, that's West Kirby. Do you recognise it? <laughs> Great picture. Uh, nice. I've heard a fantastic picture about West Kirby you know, many moons ago. Um, so why is it so different? Well, the first thing is that net zero is not based on carbon budgets. It's based on this spurious idea now of highest... Uh, possible ambition. What does that mean? Highest possible ambition. So you get a rich person, sort of, I'll figure out what highest possible ambition is in terms of reducing our emissions. And then they say, well, that's what, that's what we can do. It's not based on the science. I'd rather have something based on the numbers. So what's the global carbon budget? How do we downscale and divide that to the UK? Not ask some wealthy person with a, who has a high emitting lifestyle what, you know, what is highest possible ambition. And that's what we've done effectively. We've got the Committee on Climate Change um, to give us this idea of what's the best that we can achieve. I just think that's the wrong way of looking at it. It's the wrong JFK, J JFK question. It's not what's highest possible ambition, it's what we need to do to deliver on Paris. That's what we should have had. <laughs> and of course, this is all about endpoints, about 2050. What you can guarantee by 2050 is that the Prime Minister we have today, whether he be retired or dead, as will the rest of the policy makers, um, as will most of the Committee on Climate Change, as will I. So it's all, it's all um, we'll either be you know, retired in Tuscany, or pushing up the basis. So it's easy just to move the policy landscape out to 2050, which is really dangerous, not in my term of office. But that's what the science says. The science says what we do today, tomorrow, and that's 2030, that's the most important period. It relies, I won't go into this one, it is important, but it's quite complicated. It relies on substitution of different greenhouse gases. So carbon dioxide lasts in the atmosphere for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Some of it up to 10,000 years. As methane only arrives last day for about 10 years or so. That's oxide about 300 years. So the different greenhouse gases have different lifetimes in the atmosphere. Um, and they have different levels of certainty associated with them. So if, a, you know, if you've got a cow or a pig, they emit methane. We don't know exactly how much it varies from year to year. Yeah, it varies from season to season. It's quite unreliable to work that out. A lot of uncertainty. If you have a car and you drive and you use a litre of fuel, it's absolutely certain how much CO2 you put out. We know how much that is. And this, this net zero allows lots of substitution between things that are different chemically, last different amount of times in the atmosphere and have different levels of uncertainty. And the benefit of that, of course, is you can move things around to make, or to make things look good for you. But there's a lot more to it than that, but this substitution is really dangerous. It also embeds, and I'm not going to go into this in detail, but this is something to be really aware of, negative emission technologies. They sound like wonderful things. These either exist as very small pilot schemes or in the imagination of a few academics. Now these are technologies that we, every single, virtually every single model, including the whole policy basis for the UK, is premised on. And that is that in the future, preferably after 2050, our children and our children's children will deploy these technologies to literally suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere and then bury it deep underground. And we've completely normalised that. This language of net, net negative emission technologies or carbon dioxide removal, CBDR, all of these sorts of languages we use, 
NBS, nature-based solutions, all these things. We, we are relying on these now, in few, put, in, put into the future, to allow us to not have to change our behavior significantly today. So we, we're already using these, these techniques. Now, just to give a scale of size of these, the assumption in virtual oil models that these technologies will be roughly the same size as the current oil and gas industry. Now, if you had one scenario like that, one future like that in your estimation of the future, uh, out of 100, then maybe fine. But when virtually all of them have that in as an assumption, it's a systemic bias towards avoiding mitigation today and passing the burden on to future generations. And that's what we're doing. We're passing the mitigation burden on to future generations. We're saying to our kids, you make the cuts because we can't be bothered to do it ourselves. That's what we're doing. Um, and it's not just the policymakers, that's the, loads of the academics are involved in this as well. It's a, it, it's, a, it's a whole sort of process of delusion that's evolved, I would argue, 30, over 30 years by good, well-meaning people. Because the problem gets harder and harder and beyond our current political system and our economic system to address. It, it begs fundamental questions, profound changes, which is what I mentioned before. And in fact, what the UK is doing, if the rest of the world followed this example, and the UK is better than quite a few countries, it's still in line with about two and a half to three degrees centigrade of warming. And a lot of people are saying that the Glasgow Agreement is much nearer two degrees centigrade. That's because they believe these negative emission technologies will work at massive scale. If you take away that belief, then it doesn't hold, it's nearer three, and maybe even higher than three degrees centigrade, then towards four. Just to add my position on carbon dioxide removal or nature-based solutions or negative emission technologies, whichever acronym we use to confuse people at the moment, is that we should support research and development on them. So I'm, I'm all for doing that. Let's research and develop them. Let's put them into place if they meet stringent sustainability criteria. And that also means social criteria. So we already see around the world something called green grabs. Big chunks of forestry bought up by rich people in the West, often companies, where indigenous people live. And then we're saying that's our forest and we can use that so we can carry on our behavior back here. We're already seeing that around the world today. So, the social part of sustainability is also very important because it's already been quite destructive to many parts of the world. But we need to reduce our emissions, we need to mitigate today as if carbon dioxide removal does not work at scale. It probably won't work at scale anyway. But even if it does, as I said right at the beginning, you cannot eliminate the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. There are always going to be some emissions. And if you look at the sort of literature on this, and it's a bit vague still, somewhere between five and 10 billion tons of CO2 per year, CO2 equivalent in methane and nitrous oxide, um, will come from agriculture. And that will keep warming the planet. So we'll need to do some level of negative emissions to compensate for that. But that does mean that energy emissions have to be zero. Because you cannot eliminate all of the methane and all the nitrous oxide. But you can eliminate all use of fossil fuels. And of course, humans have lived without fossil fuels for a very long time, for probably about 200 to 300,000 years. So fossil fuels are a new thing for us that have just occurred in the last half an hour, really, in a human sort of time frame. So now I'm going to start to sort of bring this to, well, what can we... <coughs> yeah? or, uh, what, what are we going to do about climate change? Um, and there's a, people will say, if you have an equation that you lose half your audience, but you know, this is the one equation that's here, so it's quite a straightforward one. Is that the Paris Agreement plus the science and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change equals equity? And this is an area that, we, that academics almost never talk about. There are a few, but not many academics who you never talk about, the policymakers don't talk about. It was virtually unmentioned in, um, in, in Glasgow. Um, and equity is absolutely key here. And if, I think this is true regardless of your moral or your politi political position. This is just from the numbers and from the science. I think there are good moral reasons for this as well and political reasons. But if you, just, if you don't care about the morals or the politics, just follow the numbers and you get to the same conclusion. Carbon dioxide emissions are massively skewed to a handful of people around the planet, not a handful, but a small group of people around the planet. And there's, there's rates of research to show this is the case. So this is the emissions of the different groups, from the um, you know, poorest down here, the wealthiest up here. And, and this, this sort of data has been shown repeatedly. The latest stuff just came out just before Paris demonstrating this again. And very broadly, half of all carbon dioxide comes from about 10% of the world's population, of which about two-thirds of that 10% are in the wealthy parts of the world. So approximately one-third of that 10% are, are, is what makes up the OECD countries, the wealthy countries. So about a third, of, very roughly, a third of people in the UK are in that 10%. And who, who will that include? Climate change 
scientists, policy makers, barristers, journalists, entrepreneurs, business leaders, all the people that are framing the climate change agenda. And surprisingly, we never talk about equity because we're in that group. So it's the, you know, what we require is turkeys have got the vote for Christmas. Um, you know, that, that's what we're requiring because the, the group is made up out of this, this lot. And that includes, of course, people like me and probably one or two of us here. If you look around next to you, you'll see the 10 percenters. They're all sitting next to you. <laughs> <laughs> and 70% of the emissions come from 20% of the population. But most damning, and this is some interesting work from Tim Gore this year, is the top 1% of global emitters, maybe there's one or two of them here, I, don't, I really don't know, but probably, maybe, maybe not. The top 1% of global emitters have a, have a combined carbon footprint this larger than the bottom half of the global, twice as large as the bottom half of the global population. Isn't that incredibly damning? And we know who they are. I mean, we know those sorts of people. The top, you know, that's the top 1%. You look at the top 0.01%, even more. Some of the people that, that seem to like to go to space, for instance, those sorts of people that come from those <laughs> I'm not against space travel, all the, all the, the tickets are only singles. Uh, <laughs> um, in fact, I, I happily put my money into I had in my pocket and fund single tickets for some of these people. <laughs> um, and does this matter? Do, does the high emissions of a handful of people really matter? Well, again, just do the maths. So imagine that we thought climate change was a serious problem. Imagine we thought it was an existential problem. Or imagine we thought it was a climate emergency that we've all declared. And we had regulations then, because they're not going to do it voluntarily, that force the you know, do good regulations, force the top 10% of us in terms of emissions, to cut our carbon footprint to the level of the average EU citizen. So that's not, you know, it's not too draconian. The average EU citizen manages with that. And imagine the other 90% of the world's population made no change. Would that make much difference? Just the top 10% cutting to the level of the average European. I mean, massively, yeah, one third. That's one third of global CO2. There were thereabouts. And it just shows how the emissions are massively skewed to a relatively small percentage of the population where virtually all of us who work on climate change reside. And even if we don't, then we ask the RSA to the students who are desperately trying to get into that group. So uh, I talked to Eric today and some of the younger ones there. I mean, they're all aspiring to be promoted to get into the 10% group. So it does tell us something that, I mean, that won't, that won't solve climate change, but it's a pretty good start. And given that if you add together all the promises made by countries, there's virtually no reduction by 2030. This, is, you know, this shows what we could do. If we were serious about climate change, if it was an emergency, we could probably do that in a year. We could probably do it in a month if we really thought it was an emergency. So start to bring this all together now. Um, another nice picture. Is it West Kirby? Is it recognised that bit? There's some lovely pictures on the, on, 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 online for West Kirby. Um, so the headline choice for developed nations is that if our preference is to ignore international equity, um, to pass a massive burden of climate change onto our children, to be part of a two and a half to three degree C future, and to renege on our Paris and other international commitments on climate change. But that nicely fits with today's politics, um, it maintains the current economic market model, and it's sort of green, incremental greening of business as usual, then fine. Stick with 5% per annum reductions in emissions, there or thereabouts, um, and net to zero by 2050, and hope that our children will be understanding. If instead we think we should take international, um, uh, international equity seriously, then for, particularly in the wealthy parts of the world, that means that we need huge mitigation efforts by this generation, now, right now, um, to cut our CO2 in line with well, well below 1.5 degrees centigrade, or below 1.5, and even two perhaps, um, and to abide by our Paris commitments, to, so to, to, to not really able to be honest to our commitments. But that means we have to have huge amounts of government intervention. Yes, this is a, this is, we have seen a lot of that, of course, since the banking crisis and with COVID. But it's saying that would be the new norm, that the governments will have to work in a social contract fashion with the, with the populations to drive these rapid changes. Um, a reshaping of our economics, now arguably we've seen some of that as well with the banking crisis and again with COVID, but if, Fundamental reshaping of economics, um, which I would refer to in relation to climate change. I mean, the economists we see on the news night after night, they're astrologists. I mean, the market economists have nothing to say about climate change. It's a, and I've done quite a lot of work in economics in my PhD years ago. There are other forms of economics that are really helpful, ecological economics, that start to help us understand these issues. But modern form of market economics 
that tells you a lot about different shops competing, tyre shops or sock shops, but it doesn't tell us about global issues like this. It's a, it's a problem for it. So we need to reshape that. And big cuts across every sector. No sector is exempt from large cuts. No individuals, well, no, certainly no sectors. And that's 10 to 20% reduction in emissions year on year. Um, that's real zero emissions by 2030 to 2035 with equity at its core. And to give a flavour of what this might look like, some of you may have seen the government's 10 point plan or a few fidges and the, uh, fudges and the fiddle, in my view. But um, this 10 point plan it announced recently. And you think of what people spoke about in COP, what we should have been speaking about are things like the, an immediate moratorium, moratorium on any new fossil fuel developments. So this is somewhere like the UK, any wealthy country. And I probably would say that's, if you look at the numbers, and there's some work on this now, that's probably also true for quite a lot of poor countries. Um, a moratorium on airport expansion. Neither of these things we're doing, of course, we're doing just the opposite. Phase out all fossil fuel production in the West by 2030 to 2035. And the poor countries about 10 to 15 years behind that. From 2022, from January, all houses, new houses to be built should be passive house. In other words, require no energy heating. We were going to bring that legisl legislation in about eight years ago, I think it was now, uh, under the Cameron government, but the, the housing lobby was so strong, the construction industry said, no, we, we can't do it. That's been done for years. We know how to do that. It adds about 10 to 20% to the cost of the house. So you have to have no heating bills. Imagine if we'd done that before, actually, for modern houses. People would be able to live in those and not have to worry about the price of gas going up. These houses exist, they're perfectly normal houses, and on type renewables we should be having as well. But it's not just about the new houses, in fact it's mostly about the retrofit. How do we retrofit, how do we retrofit the, um, the rest of the housing stock? 26, 27 million houses in the UK, probably 20 million of them. Like my Swedish friends always sort of joke that our, a British house is like a Swedish tent. That's about how efficient they are. Um, and so we've got to make these, these Swedish tents, 20 million of them, um, suitable for the 20th century, 21st century rather. And so that's a massive, massive job agenda doing that. Move away from cars in our cities and urban environments, and that includes electric vehicles. I mean, it's a, I, I think this is a real opportunity here. We should be moving away from what we use cars for, really. Um, cars fine for longer journeys, if you can't use trains and so forth, you take your family to the beach or you go away for a weekend or whatever it might be. But are they really appropriate for moving, in my case, 82 kilograms of flesh? Well, three or four miles to pick up 10 kilograms of groceries and then drive back again in a car that weighs 2,000 kilograms? Well, it means madness. If you look from space, you think, what are these people doing? Yeah, and where they go, they carry 2,000 kilograms of metal with them just to walk down the road. It's just, it's just madness. So, and, and now we're talking about electric vehicles. That's fine if you live in the rural environment, but in our cities, is that a wise idea? And what we also do in there, we're looking to put the charging, where we put the charging points? On the pavements. So the pavements are even narrower now, so you're trying to get your pram down there, now you've got to, not only is the whole street taken up by cars, parking cars and the road, now your pavement's partly taken up by a charging system for these blessed tin boxes that are going to sit there for most of the time. So we need to think, think differently. Maybe we rent the cars on the outside of our cities, then we need to have more active travel, more public transport, maybe make sure that our working places and our, and our, our homes are a bit nearer to each other, start to rethink planning our cities and our towns. So we should be using that opportunity now. A major shift towards public transport and virtual transport as well. I, I do talk to, talk to, spoke to us talk in New Zealand and Sweden this week. Yeah, New Zealand and Sweden, both of them obviously virtually. The New Zealand one was a bit cheap because it was 5.30 in the morning. So I won't be doing too many of those, but, um, <laughs> but it was much easier than flying to New Zealand to give the talk, which is what a lot of my colleagues would prefer to do. A frequent flyer level. 70% of all the flights in the UK are carried out by 15% of the population. In any one year, half of the UK population does not fly. There are no technical solutions for flying in the short term. Okay, there will be a few electric planes that people bang on about. They'll take a handful of people, maybe one, two, three, maybe even ten, between a few Scottish islands. That's about all they'll do in any near term. And sustainable aviation fuel, it requires so much energy to make it, you need that energy for other things. So in the medium, near to medium term, if you talk to the engineers, not the financial directors in these companies, they'll tell you 2040, 2050 is the first time you get long haul flights. That are, that are common using some sort of sustainable form of power. So we need to have a frequent flyer levy or something like that that stops people flying a lot and allows people to fly occasionally if they need to go and see their family and so forth. No new fossil fuel power stations, gas, coal or oil, and a massive program of electrification. 
In our society at the moment, of our energy we use, only 20% of it is electricity. And we can make zero carbon electricity, we don't have to do that. The rest of it is fossil fuels. So we're going to have to have a massive increase in electrification, probably three or four times in 20 years. This is way beyond what most people are considering. Again, it's just what comes out of the numbers. And you don't have to consider it if you believe in negative emission technologies, which is why we keep turning the dial up on negative emission technologies to stop us having to make these difficult decisions today. So delivering on Paris requires new narratives. We need to think about what is, what, what is growth? You know, do we want economic growth or do we want growth in female literacy? Growth in improvement in river quality, in reductions of crime. You know, growth in the things in society that make our societies a good place to be, job security, all those other things. They're the things we want growth in. We don't need this, this random measure called economic growth, which we never used to even bother about before the 1950s and 60s. So it's a relatively modern idea. What does progress, what does development mean? Does this mean more stuff? If we get more crime in our society, more psychological disorders, but hey, we've got a television in the bathroom now. Is that progress? <laughs> We need to reframe value. I think COVID tells us a lot about that. I mean, we're, I mean, you could have quite easily done without a few climate professors during COVID. Wouldn't matter the slightest. But without people stuck in the shelves in Tesco's, or well, hopefully other supermarkets, but anyway, um, you know, or the support workers that looked after people. I spent weeks in hospital because of a bicycle crash because of my own stupid fault. You know, the support workers, you know, key workers were looking after me. Um, these people are, are really valuable in our society, and yet we haven't valued them for years. We've treated them with, with complete disregard, in my view. So we need to rethink that. Alternative relationships with time, learn the lessons from the past, and actually care about the future. Economists discount the future. Imagine discounting your own child's future. But that's actually what we all do. You know, when we decide, which car should I buy next? We go out, well, I better buy a four-wheel drive. It's much safer to take the children to school. Are we buying it for the children, or are we buying it for our own ego? Which one are we buying it for? The safest thing about getting your kids to school is that they can walk them to school. Or best still, try and argue that we don't have cars on our roads locally. It's so they can actually get to school on their own, like we would have all done, of course. Embed into an intergenerational equity. Get those things locked in. About, care about people elsewhere in the world. And, and also about our, our own children's future. And of course, other people in the world, I mean, even if we don't care about them, the one they can guarantee the climate change, they'll come and visit us. Because they'll have to move north to get out of the, out of the climate chaos that we've caused them. And we don't like that in Britain. We don't like people coming over here from France, for instance, as you see at the moment, where only to well, we're moan and groan and, and, and shed a few crocodile tears about people dying in the channel. But we're not prepared to really open things up for these people when they come here. So just think how badly we've been, we've, we've behaved towards migrants in the EU in the last 10 years. And we've been far more of those caused by our emissions elsewhere in the world. And we need a much deeper appreciation of the more than human world. When we're part of that human world, and part of that natural world, we're not separate from it. And we think we have, we, you know, we have nature, red in tooth and claw, we think we're instrumental, we can take what we want from nature, but we're, not, we're part of it, we have to have a better understanding of that, I think. We've really moved away from that in recent years. And perhaps ecology has taken us more that way. So where are the catalysts for change? Where, where are they coming from? Well, not the usual suspects. They're not coming from policymakers. They're not coming from the great and good. They're not coming from all the people giving wonderful speeches and all that in COP. Um, they're coming from. And they're not so. You know, Greta, I, I, I should declare this. I've worked with Greta quite a lot when I'm in Sweden, right back from before she did the school strikes. You know, Greta's not going to change the world, not change, she, but she's a catalyst for change amongst certain generations. So people like Greta, who would have thought, if you went back three years and said, who's going to change the tone of the debate on climate change? I know. A 15-year-old Swedish schoolgirl with Asperger's. Do you think? No, I wouldn't come up with that, would you? But that's what happened. You know, so they're the unusual suspects, the youth movements, the various forms of Extinction Rebellion, and, and other civil society groups. The idea you've got meetings like this. You, know, maybe, you may, may or may not be party to some group or the other, but you're interested in these issues. You come along to think about them and argue about them and discuss them with your family and friends at home and in the pub afterwards. So there's a wide dialogue going on around these sort of things. And this is where leadership is coming from now, not from our policymakers. And um, the idea of flying shame, going back a few years ago, could you imagine something called flying shame? Um, people thinking about this, and I prefer to say it's flying consciousness, rather than shame is a bit of a negative way of it. I prefer to say it's a, it's a consciousness about the impacts of these sorts of things. So, you know, it, it's not coming from the top down. It's coming much more from a messy sort of bottom up. That's where leadership's coming from. That's what's changing the tone of the debate. That's what helped drive 1.5 in Paris. That's what help, is helping some of the mayors and local councils actually push in policies that are much, well, at least targets, not the policies yet, the targets, that are much more stringent than those put in by our national governments. 
So a lot of you know, Leeds and Manchester putting in 2035 as zero emissions and 2038 in Manchester. And yeah, our government's in 2050 and 2060. So you know, there's, a, there's a whole sort of dialogue going on um, with different groups. So what could we do? There are three things that we can actually do as individuals. And the first one is to look to our own lives, look what, what's the big carbon footprint part of our own lives and try and change it. And the next thing I'm going to say sounds a bit odd. It doesn't really matter whether we succeed or not, but we should be trying. And what we have to do is talk about it with our friends and our family. Um, you know, don't bore them senseless, but try and bring it into conversations and engage them. And be honest about it. If it's hard and it, it didn't work, then say that. You know, don't try and spin a cheery yarn about it. But if it was successful and you didn't find it very difficult, then say that as well. So talk about these things openly. So what we're doing then, we're opening up a dialogue, and that's already happening. If you just sit on a bus or a train, people talk about climate change. I mean, that didn't happen 10 years ago. So it's quite, quite an odd sort of shift. Engage in our, this is for students, actually, in our university, our schools, our place of work, um, you know, any other institution we're involved with. Engage with people there. And also engage with our councils. Council, policies in the end are always local. You know, it's the, policy, the actual changes are almost always made locally. The national governments put in the umbrella framework and then the national the local governments have to deliver on that. So engage with our local councils. You know, make, have arguments with them. If they put in place things that don't fit with what, what they say their commitments are, then tell them. Use social media, use the press. Um, so we, we should be engaging much more with our, you know, with our processes of democracy. Democracy is not about putting a tick in a box every few years. It's about an ongoing, ongoing social contract between the leaders, leaders we put in, in positions of authority, at a government level, and us. It's an ongoing dialogue. And also engage with our MPs and our ministers. Email them, tweet, tweet about them, you know, write to them, um, go see them in their surgeries. Uh, and if they, again, if their commitments and their, if, their, if their policies don't fit their commitments, tell them. Be really clear about it. Be courteous, but blunt. Always courteous. Uh, but if they do something that's good, also say, well done on that. We Brits are really good at moaning, particularly down the pub. But we're not very good at actually telling people, well done. So if they do something that is right, and you think it's a good thing, then you know, let them know that as well. In 2021, climate change has become system change. It wasn't in 1990, it probably wasn't in 2000, it was getting more like that in 2010 and 2021. You know, we've lost the chance for, make, for responding to climate change without radical changes to our system. And arguably the wider set of ecological crises suggests we need that anyway. Um, as Einstein noted, this is attributed to him, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And we've done that for 30 years. Um, and in my view, um, we have passed that on you know, we're passing the consequences of that on to our children, what we've just, you know, the same sort of levels of insanity. And net zero is the latest, net zero 2050 is the latest framing of that. And that's that ongoing insanity of doing very little today and passing on to future generations. So on that note, I think it's, yeah, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, thank you for, for that. But thank you, Kevin, for what we didn't mention anything about the um, <coughs> the, the center uh, and your history. No, no, Petra, Petra Campbell industry. But before I, I I ask for questions, I've got one. Um, yeah, I've read please? before about the. Um, uh, I've read that the we will need more, more than four times as much electricity than we are using today. If, if this is going, if this is going to work across the world, where is that going to come from? Okay. Um, but it will vary from country to country. So some countries have a massive renewable potential. In the UK, is, we have one. We've got a huge amount of wind. We have a massive tidal range on the west coast, particularly. We've also got moderately okay solar facilities and uh, opportunities here. If you go to Saudi, Australia, Qatar, some of the, some parts of the states, massive solar potential as well. So from a renewable energy potential, there is, there is plenty, of, there's plenty of energy out there, I mean, way more than we actually use. It's, it's, we have to harness it, and, we, and we, if we started earlier, it would have been much better. And you mentioned before, the wind turbines off here, we're already starting to see lots more wind turbines, yeah. and they're phenomenally effective. I mean, they're, they're what's called their capacity factor is about half, 0.5, in other words, they can generate enough power, for about half the year they're working um, at full capacity on average. And if you've got lots of them around, then that means most of the year you've got energy off them. So that works pretty well. Um, so there's plenty of options for renewables, and the only, the only really zero carbon or very low carbon options are the renewables, solar, uh, wind, tidal, 
wave um, yeah, I'm gonna touch that but um, bio bioenergy, but very limited on bioenergy. It's very limited and it's a, as an engineer I find it a bit embarrassing to talk about bioenergy. Burning plants doesn't seem like very sophisticated in twenty twenty one but anyway. But burning plants using bioenergy to make fuels and so forth. And nuclear. Nuclear is very low and there are lots of reasons I'm agnostic about nuclear. I, I supervise a big project on it, but um, it's very low emissions, roughly the same life cycle emissions as the renewables. Um, it has lots of other issues which you will have your different views on it, so it's polarizing of all the technologies. But it is low carbon, and, and we don't have very much of it. A lot of people think we have much more than we actually really have. It's about under 4% of the UK's energy consumption is from nuclear, 20% of electricity. Okay, thanks. Sorry. Okay, you're going to have to shout so that everyone hears the question. We don't have two mics. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I thought I was listening to you down the side of practice. <laughs> I'm not sure if that is a compliment or an insult. I'll take it as a compliment. Um, it's the problem uh, that we're not really in a democracy in that there's too many elderly people like me. Um, elderly people tend not to change. You know, they say they're concerned about the climate, but they find it extremely difficult to change their behaviours. You repeat the answer. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> they have a majority of adults in the is there, a, is there a failing of democracy in that there are too many, I'm always going to say this, there are too many old people and, and they, are, they are reluctant to change, typically more reluctant to change, more generally willing to change. I, I think there are some failures in our democracy, I don't think that's one of the ones. I mean, I think it's, a, I think it's something we should celebrate that people are living older, to older, as long as the quality of life is good. I mean, I'm, I'm heading in that direction, so I want it to... <laughs> Um, so as long as the quality of life is good, I think it's, it, it's great people living longer and we should celebrate that. Um, and I'm, I remain reluctant to accept this idea that um, old dogs can't, be, can't learn new tricks. Yeah, that's probably a bit of a wrong way to put it, but that's yeah, one of the old expressions. I think it may be more difficult, but it's interesting, quite a lot of places that I've worked, that people at events like this actually are go out afterwards I mean, they may, just, you know, may disagree with me, so maybe you are not do anything at all, but quite a lot of people go out and actually start to engage with their local um, MPs. They might go and join some group. They may actually engage with some of the youth movements. And certainly in Sweden, it's been really interesting, this link between the generations. They've always have jumped over the generation in the middle. We've got sort of grandparents engaging with their grandkids mm. about climate change. And I think that's really, pos really positive, because then the grandchildren are absolutely full of en energy and still, and I mean this in a positive way, they're, they've still got their ideologies, and I think ideologies are a wonderful thing. They're not yet corrupted. But the great thing about that is they engage the grandparents who can actually write and do things. You know, people that, you know, they, people, of, people of this generation, I mean, there's some of you here, um, and including myself now, we are very good at writing, we're engaging, we're engaging with people. We're the ones that moan and groan. We can write our letters, we can email, we're the sorts of people that get on and do that. We're not often afraid to do it as well. So um, listen, listen to your grandchildren. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, over there, please. And, do you want to, I can give you the mic if you would like. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to ask you what your priorities would be for using electrical energy. Because it seems to me that um, we don't have the infrastructure in terms of renewables, and yet we've got to a massive you know, change now. So do we stop using Twitter, or do we stop using um, you know, all our... Um, Blockchaining and all the rest of it, or what, what do we what do we prioritise? I mean, I tend to be prioritise electric cars, maybe, but what would be your priorities? Mm. I'd certainly get rid of blockchain. Um, <laughs> I, 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 myself and some colleagues in Leeds, we wrote something about this a while ago. We, called, we said we needed a triage approach, like in medicine. So if you've got a limited amount of resources for something, how do you most usefully spend it? And so we were arguing about the, the particular pieces about electric cars, saying, look, if you've got a limited amount of electricity, is it wise to put it into a car to drive a few kilometres, or should you use it to drive your operating theatre, or run a local company, or help your school heat? So I think that's a really important point, is where, until we have lots and lots of renewable energy, which is going to be, you know, even if we went all out for it, it's going to be 10, 20 years to get huge quantities of it, then until that point, we need to make sure we use what we have wisely. Um, so, and, and look, some things as well, we, some things are much easier to make low carbon, like say, so for instance, servers, you mentioned Twitter, but the servers that, that allow us to use all the electronic um, uh, computers and websites and all the rest of that that we, that we engage with now, they, they use about, well, they emit about as much carbon dioxide as the whole aviation sector. 
But we can decarbonize that really quickly. In fact, there's so much money in that industry, it'd be very easy to decarbonize it really quickly, as we can't do that with, with aviation, and we know what to do technically. So, um, some of the technologies need to be used as well, as industries use to pressurize so that they start to decarbonize their own practices by requiring them to use zero carbon energy, which means they have to start to invest in that as well to accelerate that process. Um, but yeah, you're right, you need to look at what are the most important things. And, we, and you know, servers are important, things like refrigerators. If you're going to buy a refrigerator, buy an A++ one, because they'll use about um, half the energy of an A-rated refrigerator. An A-rated refrigerator is rubbish. We've got this ridiculous labeling system. So you need to work on this A++, but also not double doors, single doors. All of us would be brought up with either no refrigerator or one that fitted underneath the counter. So why now do we need one that goes like this? That you get, you know, a family of four would have lived in it years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Yeah. Yeah, I was interested, uh, you mentioned your previous life at uh, Point of Air yeah. uh, from North Wales. So, strangely, um, some of us representing Friends of the Earth and Extinction Rebellion have got uh, control of a conversation with the local city region combined authority next Friday, in fact, about their plans for high net, the blue hydrogen and carbon capture storage scheme. Um, is there one kind of takeaway quote from Kevin Anderson that we can put on the table? <laughs> <laughs> Um, for those that aren't familiar with blue hydrogen, blue hydrogen is where you, the fo is it, well it's another excuse for the fossil fuel industry to carry on existing. So it's basically taking natural gas, which is methane, it's, it's CH4, carbon and hydrogen, splitting the carbon and hydrogen using some technique, usually steam reformation, burying the CO2 underground, that's the storage part, and then using the hydrogen. And they say, well we've got blue hydrogen, hydrogen is low carbon. If you look at the life cycle emissions, there's a good paper in 2017 by Gibbon, there's a meta study, looks at lots of other studies. The life cycle emissions of these systems, of carbon capture and storage systems, including making hydrogen, are far too high to fit within our sort of Paris commitments. It's the full life cycle emissions you need to look at. So you can, the capture part can be done really well, but getting the gas out of the ground means you'll have lots of methane leaks, and lots of energy use, but mostly it's the methane side. So, so look at the life cycle emissions. It's the full life cycle emissions. They're roughly, this is very much on the outside, for you if you're going to talk to them, somewhere about 100 to 250, 300 grams of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilowatt hour. So you want to know what the full life cycle emissions need to be. And um, nuclear renewables are around about 5 to 15 grams. Gas on its own is about 450 grams. Coal is about 900 grams. So, you get the paper. That's almost a sentence, yeah. yeah, yeah get, given, <laughs> give, don't get the paper, but get given. Get, 2017, given. Uh, um, life cycle emissions electricity. Any other questions? Okay. Sorry, can you just hold on? Good one here. <laughs> you might have on your hand though. Comments in a sense rather than a question. What you said tonight is utterly scary for most people. And I, the people I talk to and uh, have contact with can't psychologically take this on board. How do we cope with the psychology of this? That, that is a really important question. And, and I've been interviewed by that. About, you know, working on it, some, some of my colleagues find it really difficult area to work on. And that's why I think quite a few academics spin a cheery yarn. They're not spinning it for other people. They're spinning it for themselves. It's not a nice place to work in. But to me, the two things, one that personally for me, that what helps me is my, my closest friends never went to university. The ones I cycle with and rock climbing with. One of my, my closest friends runs a fish and chip shop, another one makes pottery. And we talk about other things, and that helps. But also, there are lots of things we can do. It's not as if we're not with it. We know what we need to do. We're just reluctant to do it. So I think, I, to me, despair comes out of a really bad problem that you've no idea what to do. We've got a really bad problem, and we know what to do. And we've known what to do for a long time. And so it's in that where the hope arrives, to me, um, and I think other people have different views on that. And it's interesting that a lot of people argue it's been really unfair on young people because they're feeling really disillusioned. And someone pointed out just the other day, if you talk to a lot of young people in their campaigns, they, they, do, they don't think the future is looking very promising for themselves. But they're still there arguing for change. They're full of hope and opportunity for change, even though they think the future is really depressing for them. And so for them, to some extent, there's this combination of the two. That doom is driving their action and their passion. I, I think that part of the you know, solution to that is to realize we're all in this together. together yeah. 
because psychologically you're right it's difficult to contain it as an individual mm. you know it's we're all in it yeah. and if we all start to change behavior and, and work together and realize that that is happening you see people working together mm. it, it starts to rub off i think anyway yes. there was a question here. Um, um, one of the biggest questions really is never answered is the population explosion and that uh, we know that the resources on this planet are, aren't infinite. Yeah. And that is one of the big problems, is that we have an expanding population of humankind. And also, to, you cannot sustain growth on growth. That's why you need a system change. So therefore, how do you get those few, the 10% that you mentioned, uh, to uh, change their lifestyle because they're going to protect what they've got. Yep. They don't. We've learned through re, re, all the policies so far that the people that are going to suffer most are the poorest people. For example, there was one woman who travelled thousands of miles to get to Glasgow from an island, and she, she wasn't even let into the meeting. And their island will disappear. Yep. Um, I would like to fill a green and float around on this big, big yacht the size of a football field. That inequality is a big problem. And they, they survive on the, on the whole theory of growth on growth. Yep. Good point. Yeah. And um, I agree with much of what you have to say there. I will just make two comments. One on population. From a climate change point of view, it's not a population problem. It's a consumption problem. So even if the, you know, the Chinese people, if they carry on growing, uh, increasing their wealth, welfare as they are doing today, by 2030 they still will have very low emissions compared with us. And so um, yeah, overall emissions and other forms of consumption. So, it's, so from an emissions point of view, it's much more about consumption of those of us who are the high emitters. But from a sustainability point of view, in terms of food and other resource use, actually I think population becomes an issue. So we have to think about issues of population, but we have to be very careful how we think about it. Because you end up with it in really quite worrying, you know, every time we try to control population, something disturbing comes out of trying to do that. If we, try to, if we really want to control sustainability, then we need to look to ourselves and, uh, you know, uh, and you know, think about who are the ones we're going to cull. And we know who they are. I did. Uh, partly I was going to say to this gentleman that there was very regard to the garden a week ago by Rebecca Solnit about um, oh, yeah. oh, oh, sorry. Um, there was a good article in The Guardian about how to cope with the uh, stresses, psychological stresses of, uh, of um, climate change by Rebecca Solnit. But I was going to ask you, um, how should our retrofitted houses in the future be heated? Yeah. Uh, heating is a really huge issue. Uh, the amount of energy used in UK housing for heating is the same as our total electricity consumption. So electricity consumption and heating are both the same, about 300 terawatt hours, some of the numbers. Um, and that's a hugely important issue. So if you're going to retrofit them, then you probably will see somewhere, in theory, you should see somewhere about a 70 to 80% reduction in your energy consumption. But in practice, when it has been done, you see something like a 50 to 70% reduction. But then you still have to heat the rest of it. And there are different ways of looking at that. One is through heat pumps, if they're viable. If you've got ground, they're expensive at the moment. If you've got land, you can use a ground source heat pump. It's a bit like a refrigerator in reverse. So you put some energy in, it sort of sucks, and then it sucks the heat out of the atmosphere, either out of the ground or out of the air. So it sounds like magic, but it's not really, almost. Um, and so with every unit of energy you put into this thing, you get like three units of energy out of it. And if you use a ground source heat pump, if you've got enough land, then you can easily heat your house with that. Otherwise, you have to use an air source heat pump, and they're not quite as efficient, but they're still very good. Um, and the Swedes moved across from, the Swedes were like us, except they used oil. So they had about 80% of their houses, roughly, were all oil central heating. And then after the oil price shock in the 70s and the early, after the 80s, they switched deliberately away from oil, and they went to heat pumps and district heating for virtually all their society. So a bit like us, we're all gas now, or mostly all gas. And, um, and the same thing could happen here. The other district heating is another one where you use some sort of thermal power station. 
So it could be a nuclear one, but it could, I mean, if it's not thermal, then you can't do this, but if it's, a nuclear, if it's a thermal power station, you can tap off some of the heat and you can use the waste heat off that um, to, to run that through pipes that go in into a house in, in radiators. These Europeans have been using that for years. The Swedes use it in a lot of their cities. So the, the flat I have when I'm in Sweden is heated by district heating. But their district heating actually uses waste, and that is, a, that is a good and a bad thing. They use waste products from the forestry industry, and they have a lot of that, so that's sort of okay-ish. But they also import a lot of waste from Newcastle, which is like plastic waste and paper waste, and they can bust that in there as well. And it's well controlled from a pollution point of view, but it's lots of carbon. So you've got to, if you're going to have district heating, it's got to be low carbon. Um, so heat pumps, district heating, um, there are one or two other options out there as, as well. Uh, some people have been at hydrogen as one of the options to put down the But I think you were also saying that if we insulate our houses better, much. we won't need the heat. Yeah, no, we need much less. I mean, you can make modern houses with no heating. I, I, I did a cycle tour in Sweden to give lectures and so forth for two weeks, which is quite hard work, cycling every day, but anyway. But um, I stopped off one lunchtime into some passive houses that had been built 14 or 15 years before. The families that lived in them, they looked like normal houses to me, normal Swedish houses. The family living in them that I went to speak to was just a normal family. It wasn't a green family, it was a normal family. They would used no heating in 14 years in Sweden. No heating. They had to heat the water and for showers, but no heating of the house in 14 years. Okay, the question back there. Um, I need to get the mic to you, Doc. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I don't think I've actually got a question. It's, it's possibly more of a comment, but I think um, I'm really interested in the psychological aspect that was brought up earlier. I think it, it's almost now, you know, I think for those of us who've been following all this for decades, and kind of thank you very much for all the work you've done over many, many years to inform myself and, you know, millions of other people. It's so valuable. But it's, in a sense, it's the same story I was listening to 20 years ago. It's just that. You know, we've moved on a bit, but not very much. And it's almost now as if it's a psychological, social problem rather than a, an ecological or a climate problem because we're just not coming to terms with it. And I suppose what I wanted to say, and in terms of uh, generating something really positive from this and everybody who's here tonight and listening to it, because I'm a local councillor and I'm trying my best to get the, the council to do the right things. And in many respects, it's really improving and it is trying to do the right things. Uh, but all the, the right things we're trying to do, and there's plenty of examples locally, uh, just in the last year or so, whether it's rewilding the beach at Hoy Lake, increasing parking charges, taking space away from cars and giving them to bikes, we get ferocious opposition from the minority of people. And I think it's so important for people like me who are trying to implement change, even if it's relatively small change, but it's important, and as you said, at the local level, that's where real change happens. It's so important that people who are here tonight actually speak up for those policy changes. Now, whether it's on social media, or whether it's writing to your local representatives, your local MPs, or standing up and doing whatever you can, that is so important to actually say the right thing and challenge the people who are actually against progressive change that actually improves things from a climate point of view. And the other thing that is absolutely really helping, and it's kind of touched on just at the end of your talk, but I think nowadays it's actually the most important thing, is the extinction rebellion, is the insulate Britain, is the direct front of this world. Uh, and if people feel that they can do that kind of thing, from my point of view as a policymaker, I'm not going to do it, I don't feel able to do that. But I get enormous strength and courage and resilience from the people who do do that kind of thing. And standing up for those people, is really, really important as well. So I hope everybody who's here tonight can kind of take the, all of the knowledge from your talk and convert it in their own little way into actions that will actually really help those of us who are trying to implement change. That's not a question. Yeah. Yeah. of getting a, a zero carbon a housing project, a little one, uh, started on site. Uh, what should I be calling it if zero carbon is, uh, is, is not the right phrase? Sorry, a zero carbon housing project? Yeah. yeah. Well, if it is real zero carbon, that's great. I hope it is. Well, um, calculations say so. Yeah. Don't use language like carbon neutral. <laughs> 
They had brew dog abuse that recently. You can drink their beer. And they, they, they were even worse. They were carbon negative. As you drank their beer, you actually saved the climate. <laughs> maybe you drank lots and lots of their beer so you, you know, fell in front of a bus. Maybe that would help. Um, I mean, zero, if it's genuinely zero carbon, then, then call it that. Um, but people will push you on it, quite rightly, in some respects. I mean, it's the, I don't know what the construction will be. Construction often embeds a lot in construction issues a lot. Does, yeah. yeah, that's uh, unless you're doing something there, say with much more with timber rather than cement, then, then if, you, if you're doing that as well, then that's great. But even if you're using cement and then it's passive house, you can just be honest about it and say it's zero emissions from its operation or from running the house. Yeah. If they're really I'm, I'm trying to achieve um, the 2030 uh, target that the RIVA have set for the construction carbon. Yeah. So it's not by no means perfect. But yeah, but, yeah that's, right. that's good. Yeah. I mean, not, not of the, we, we must let the perfect get in the way of the good, but we have to be, it has to be good. It's not, they, they can't let the perfect get in the way of the okay. I mean, we're too late for okays. We've got to do good. But, but there are plenty of things we know what to do. And so, you know, as individuals and, and say, it's councils and to support our councils, I mean, that, that's so important to support good decision making. So we said we were going to have a break before we started oh, the yeah, questions, really? but we never did. <laughs> you have a question? I forgot about that. I did like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask about your students, actually, because it struck me that when you said earlier business studies is not something that um, business in general and the whole way that society is structured, whether, however we're much we're actually aware of it, uh, has a huge impact. Mm. And obviously, we, we know the guy who, who was working on the hockey stick. Um, Michael Mann was yeah. completely discredited by people. We, we, never, we never found out who it was, but basically, you know, but, but it's this conspiracy thing about business, and, and it's, it's finding that tipping point because unless that tipping point happens, I mean, it's got to come from somewhere. It could be undermined by lots of you know younger people kind of talking to their parents, and then you end up with shareholders having queries about particular ways of going about doing certain things. I'm just asking in terms of your own, you know, the work that you do, do you manage to speak to different students apart from just people who are, you know, scientists? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, well, actually in Sweden particularly so. It's, it's, it, in the U, I'm not about any complaints about my own university, but the, the, the teaching system is much more onerous um, in Manchester, uh, so there's lots of other commitments, so I don't get to engage quite so much, but actually, oddly enough, I probably give more lectures to the non-climate groups around the university, to business students, um, and to the, some of the, in the humanities. In Sweden, it's a much wider group of people that I, that I lecture there, it's because it's an easier process because of their arrangements and so forth. Um, so I do engage with, with, with these other groups, uh, and you're quite right, and they, they, they go out, in fact, the talk I gave in Arab today was one of the students I used to teach, I used to see him at the end in case he asked me some questions. I have to say I couldn't really remember. There's lots of them in a class and like six years ago. But he now works for Arab and he asked me to give this talk today for Arab to talk about you know, civil engineering and the projects that they work on. So the students do go out and then of course they're the ones that in businesses and in governments as well, they go on to make a difference. So it is important to engage with them. Um, and they often, I mean, I think that generally, this goes back to someone's comment earlier, but the young, it's easier for the younger generation to see to see the world slightly differently because they're not yet locked into all the baggage that the rest of us have. We, we have our whole life experiences and so forth, which means it does make us a little bit narrower in how we view the future. As I think they're a little bit more open about that. Um, it doesn't mean to say we have to be completely narrow, we can try to we do our best to try and open ourselves up for this. But I think some of the students are actually really interesting because they do see the world in a different way and that's really hopeful and they see businesses as different. So quite a few of them are trying to drive a different ethos in, within business. Do we have to have shareholders? Do we have to have fiduciary duty? Do we have to actually always get an increase in return to shareholders? Do we need shareholders? A lot of German companies don't have shareholders. They're family-run businesses and the family's been in the industry, in the community for the last 30, 40, 50, 100 years. Their job is within the community. It's not there to maximise return for the shareholders. And so they have a much more of a long-term attitude towards these things. Another question. Yeah. Just I, I'd just like to talk about maintaining optimism about your, your kind of uh, mental health about climate change because I've been battling since 2018 against the Liverpool local plan which um, even before they declared a climate emergency 
Um, they had backed the expansion of Liverpool John Lennon Airport over Greenbelt and the construction of a major new carriageway. So even though that, that, that's, that's actually been rubber stamped now by an independent, so-called independent inspector, and they're about to vote on it in 2000 and, it's 2022 in January. Your phrase, I've written down, policy doesn't match commitments, is so true of local city council. But why do I keep battling? Why do I spend so much of my retirement battling? It's, and, and there's been a big boost recently by COP26. And I'm so energised. I was working along with two other people. People in this table and other people, we had 18 people on our last Zoom, um, Zoom meeting. My, my colleague here is, is giving a talk in the metal box factory about climate, uh, the, the effect of pollution. So I'm energised by the, the youth. I've been on some of the climate, uh, the school climate strikes and stuff like that. I am feeling much more optimistic after COP. I think there's a big groundswell of, um, of enthusiasm and awareness <coughs> of the predicament we're in. So I, for one, feel energised, and I think people here are all, you know, to a person, yeah. going to go out and do something. I certainly am going to do more than I do already. Um, anyway, thank, thank you for your talk. It's not a question. No, it's no. just I, I'm energised by you and energised by COP26. Yeah. Thank you. I'll just comment quickly on the COP26, just one comment then. But, yeah, I was just going to ask one more. Just to say, there wasn't one COP. There was the formal COP which is basically white men in suits who just rambled on like they had done the last 19 years. And then there was the, the, blue, there was the green zone and there was the people's summit. And that's where a lot of the civil society groups were. And we always see them in pictures of marches and so forth. But actually, they're in there having discussions and engaging with local policymakers and doing lots of real on the ground stuff. And that is so powerful. That's the powerful part that I've felt in the last three years that's, that's driven hope, has come out of those civil society groups and sort of things that you're doing. And, then, and I think there's much more impetus behind that now. So I, I, think, I think the post made in 1970 and the public somewhere about 2010. We've got a long way to go, but it's, it's really, real hope is actually resides within civil society at the moment. Like the friendly festival. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I've got a very boring practical question. Um, millions of people in the UK live in Victorian houses like I do, yeah. and they're not designed to be heavily insulated or they compensate. And I've had very clear advice about that, and I've experienced condensation in my own house and been told to ventilate it much more. Um, also, I had my boiler replaced, and there were no realistic options apart from getting a gas boiler. Mm. What can we do systemically about provision of heating to our houses, because that's not a local solution, as far as I can see? And what advice do you have to the middle of us who live in your normal Victorian terrace? Yeah. I lived in one of those as well, so it's sort of like basically a single wall, and there's no, there's no cavity. Um, so the same sort of thing there. Um, firstly, they, they can be retrofitted, but it's much more expensive. And they can be retrofitted with ventilation as well. Now, our big issues though, for instance, a lot of terrace houses, they're quite small rooms anyway. If you insulate on the inside, they get even smaller. But some of the insulation on the inside now is, much, is, is nowhere near as thick as it was. <coughs> so that, you can inside, insulate inside, you can insulate the outside. The problem then is you change the character of the buildings. So there are, there are issues about that. So you can retrofit terraced houses. There are companies that do it, and it's not cheap. You're talking 40, 60,000 pounds. So it's not a cheap thing to retrofit an old house, a terraced house. But people are doing it. I know people in Wales that are doing it now, and they're using straw, not even using modern materials. They're using, well, they're using, very cleverly using some sort of natural materials to insulate. Um, but it is taking up quite a lot of space, and it's very, very labour intensive and very expensive, which is why I think we need to have a much more systemic view driven by governments on this. There's some interesting stuff just been produced in, in, in Italy about retrofitting and on-site renewables. Just in the last week or two, the gov government's pumped in about nine, nine billion euros, and that's only for one or two years, I think, into any, almost anyone can apply, and they'll pretty much cover all the costs. And it's all part of a post-COVID trying to get people employed again. And the great thing about retrofit, including the sort of properties you're in, and say it's a system issue, is it requires high-quality labour to do that. It's not call centre work, it's not zero hours contracts, it's people that are properly apprenticed who do the work because actually it's almost, well it is harder to do retrofit than to build a new passive house. 
because you get all the what's called cold bridging, technical issues about why it's much more difficult to customize for every single house to make it really efficient. Um, so it's lots of labor, quality labor, for the next 20 to 30 years while we retrofit 20 million houses in the UK. It will be expensive. You cannot expect all the people in the houses to do it. And we may have to think more innovatively. So I was talking to, with Eric today about things like a, a sort of glass uh, esophagus over some terrace streets. So could you actually put the back of the houses under some sort of huge glass house in some way that they can actually then live outside partly with the light anyway at the back? Is that some way you can do that rather than to retrofit every individual house? So I'm not saying that's going to work, but it's just trying to say, are there, are there other ways to start to think about how we deal with these things in our houses? And you're right on the heating side, it's, it's difficult to go other than gas. You probably could use an air source heat pump. I don't know if you looked into that, there, there will be pricing, but terrace houses can still use an air source heat pump with the, with the, with the, um, with the pump in the back uh, in the backyard. I thought that was annoying this year actually because houses are very close to each other. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think, uh, yeah, one of the problems of the construction industry is deeply conservative. I mean, that is a big problem it's, and it's been an obstacle to driving innovation for a long time. Yeah, they're, they're all over the Swedish flats. Um, I haven't noticed much noise. They're probably noisy because our windows are crap. But if you actually had decent windows that kept the sound out, then you wouldn't have to worry about the noise from the, from the air source heat pump. So I think there are plenty of technical things we can do, even in your house, but they're not cheap. Okay, there's another hand up back here. Is there any uh, digest or summary of, of the presentation you made tonight that we, we uh, leave we can access and uh, get the benefits of it? Working through it. This gentleman here is filming it. Um, we'll load it up on the website for, uh, uh, for the <coughs> art centre, probably on the Facebook page. And if you remind Saturday. me, I'll okay. send you other, I can send you some things that I've written and other people may have written. I can send you links to other videos. There's loads of ones out there, so I can, I can add them. If, if someone contacts me, I'll, I'll pass on the links to you. Yeah, sure, and send them to me, and I'll. Sure the arts you've got the, the video you also here. have a presentation on Twitter that you gave online, I think, to New Zealand. Oh, that's what I was just, yeah, that was really Which is about the same title as this. Yeah, I look a bit sleepy. It doesn't, doesn't have a picture of West Korea. But it doesn't, it's got a picture of New Zealand, that's swapped them out. <laughs> I want to thank you for confirming uh, very visually um, all the points that I, I already have collected. Um, that I, I knew about. So there's one thing that does concern me when I look at the demographic of, of all the people here, is how do we get young people involved in these meetings? We should not be divisive. We, they are the people that are going to be affected more than we are. And what I will say is I, I work a, 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 amongst you people, and this is why I know you say by the Greta Thunberg, and my niece is the head of Extinction Rebellion, in Oswald Street, is because they don't have anyone that looks like them representing them. And that's what, that what concerns them. That wherever you go, and um, the meetings, and everyone here uh, to, to, uh, to enforce the importance of climate change and how immediate the response should be, these young people want to be represented and they don't feel represented, that's the biggest problem. And I don't think we should be divided, we, sh we, should, have, we should have a whole congregation of young people, mixed age groups, and that's what I would like to see. How do we do that? And that's what, and I, I can understand why they have Extinction Rebellion, because they don't feel represented, and that's why they're shouting. And what, what we've got to bring them on board, right, Thank you. Thank you. I mean, do you give this talk to uh, schools? And um, yeah. I, I, the youth. Um, uh, I don't do this. I, did, I have given talks to, to schools, and um, I have other colleagues that are much better at doing that. I think somehow another older grey white man in the front of their school is perhaps not the right way forward. So I have other colleagues that are younger, um, and this, obviously there's a greater sort of empathy of, that they can aspire to be this other person who's 25 rather than 59. And so I think, I think sometimes that can help. It's not always the case, and sometimes we can engage perfectly well. But I think it's, other times I think there's some benefit in having someone that they can sort of slightly more um, empathise with. So my colleagues do that a lot. Yeah. And in things like the Scottish, I was involved in this, very hard work this was, but the Scottish Climate Assembly, 
There was a Scottish Youth Climate Assembly as well. That was separate, though there were lots of young people who were in the main assembly as well, but there was a deliberate one there for children, uh, young adults and children below 16 and down. And so they produced a report as well. The Scottish Climate Secretariat, who represent the government, did really emphasise the importance of their report. The Welsh government has something called Funky Dragon years ago, and they had the Welsh Climate Change Commission. And so they, they engaged a lot of youths in different schools around, yeah. um, around Wales. So quite a few policymakers are trying to do that. Um, to, get the, to get the voice of youth you know, uh, heard in these debates. But I also think that the voice of youth is one of the things that's driven a lot of the change amongst the older generations. Yeah. I mean, if it wasn't for them, we would not be asking the questions a lot of us are asking. So, you know, thank God they're there, because they, they have yeah. a certain degree of integrity that some of us have, have lost. Yeah, yeah. Funky Drag, a new source of energy, maybe, probably. Don't miss any more hands up. Oh, <laughs> you warned them out. <laughs> After youth in the audience, they'd still be. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm jesting. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so thank you for, again for yeah, coming. Uh, I do want you to say a little bit about what the petrochemical okay. industry, how, how it influenced your your pathway, your career. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so a lot of people think it's a bit odd that I came from working with the petrochemical industry. I actually left school at 16 and worked on ships. I did my apprenticeship in the, as a marine engineer in the engine rooms of ships travelling around the world, which I wish I'd never left. Um, and then later on went to do engineering at university, then went to work and designed offshore oil platforms. But a lot of people think it's strange. It was a revelation, but it wasn't for me. I was interested in environmental issues from being a kid. I lived in Sizewell, uh, in, down where the nuclear power station is, and my dad worked as a fitter, as a maintenance fitter, like a mechanic, on the reactor. That's his job. Working on the reactor. So I lived down there next to the nuclear power station, surrounded by countryside of East Anglia, but also with my dad really keen on the issues of energy. So we used to chat about this all the time. And then we used to go to Scotland every year and stop off in the Mons family, who were all Yorkshire miners when the mines still operated. In, in, if anyone knows that part of the world, then Donis, Don, Doncaster, Mexborough, Cunningsborough, Denneby, Maine, the old mines. Grand, uh, granddad, 13 brothers and sisters, they either lived in the mine, work, worked at the mines, or were married to miners. So we used to stay there every year, it was fantastic watching the old workings. And then we used to go to Scotland, where my dad came from, to the west coast, the Isle of Arran, where my uncle was a shepherd, so it was a crofter. And it's so this sort of combination of all this nuclear power, living by the sea, going to see these coal, fire, these coal areas, which I loved, but really exciting every year, and then going up to the west coast of Scotland. Sort of brought in this combination of nature and, and environment, but also engineering. So I liked all of those things together. And I never really lost that. Even when I worked on the ships, I was always worried about the pollution that we put into the sea, sewage in those days. When I worked on the oil rigs, I was interested in the CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons that we were um, venting. I, I tried to change two of the main protocols offshore for oil slicks, oil spills, and also CFCs. Um, and then climate change came a big issue. And I didn't know enough about it then, so I left the oil industry to go back to university to find out about climate change. And I briefly went back into the oil industry just to get some money so I could sit in an economics course, because I, I couldn't really believe how crap economics was. So I thought I should find out, is it really, must have much more to it than I realised it wasn't three years later. <laughs> um, so so it's, been, it's never been a great revelation, it's been an incremental, incremental journey to where I, am, where I am today. But I have still friends who work in the petrochemical industry. Lots of good people work on the rigs, work in the petrochemical industry. The industry itself is, is deeply, uh, deeply flawed and is part, uh, deeply part of the problem. Yeah, uh, the Exxons, the BPs, the Shells, they've been basically, bluntly, they've been lying about climate change for years. And there's lots of evidence to show they've been doing this now. It's not, I can say that because the courts will back me up on it. You know, there's plenty of evidence we mustn't say this. And this is what our scientists have found out, but we have to de deny it. And so this has been going on for years. And even the BPs and Shells and the Equinors, or Statoil as, as it was in, in Norway, these are still part of the problem. I actually prefer Exxon. So I prefer the BP and Shell. I prefer a, sh a wolf in wolf's clothing <laughs> rather than a wolf in sheep's clothing, which is what BP and Shell are. They try and pretend to be part of the solution. Then you look at their scenarios, which are washed with fossil fuels and negative emission technologies in the future. The fossil fuel industry today, not the people who are working in it, but the upper end of the fossil fuel industry, is deeply part of the problem. And we, we cannot rely on them to solve it. And their latest scam is blue hydrogen. Um, so they, they are unable to respond to these challenges. Um, that's not to say the workers within it have got a whole set of skills that we require in making the shift to renewables. So that's the point. The workers within these communities, the engineers, the geologists, all the other people there, there's plenty of work for them in moving to decarbonise society. But the mindset of the people that operate these companies is completely at odds with addressing climate change. Yeah. Okay, the other, the other point I was wondering to talk about, but um, I'll bring it up now, 
greenhouse gases were first, let's call it, discovered by John Tyndall. And you were going to say, no, he was a woman in America. Well, no, it was Fourier first in 1927. Oh, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but John Tyndall was very important in that. Yeah, and you, you were the director of the Tyndall Institute yeah. in, in Man Manchester. And, uh, but, but it was almost an accident, I think, that he discovered that, um, yeah. that you know, these molecules of carbon dioxide would vibrate when the ultraviolet radiation went into them. Yeah. And um, it didn't happen the other way with it. The sun's rays came in through the atmosphere. Mm. When they came back out, they got trapped in this vibrating molecule of carbon dioxide, methane, and the other stuff. So, what was it like being director of the Tyndall Institute? Well, it, it, it was good. Yeah, the, the Tyndall Centre. First, it was set up in it was set up in 2000, which is actually quite. It's lasted a long time, and it was set up expressly to be interdisciplinary. So, it's got engineers, it's got scientists, it's got social scientists, it's got people from the humanities. And we all try and work together, and that was quite a novel thing to do in those days. In 2000, that was still, you know, people didn't, didn't work like that, and it actually has been really successful. And we've all got on very well after we all initially couldn't understand each other. It's like a different language. If you're an engineer, you talk to a social scientist, you think, well, which language are they speak? Yeah. And it's the same. So we, we've learned those languages, and other people have come to join us now over lots of years, um, and they like the idea of looking at the world from all syst a system perspective. Um, and John Tyndall was important because. The, we often use the shorthand of climate science. There is no climate science. It's just science. I was banging on about this to people. It's the same thing when people say, oh, I don't believe the science. Well, you don't believe the science. It's just science. It's the same science makes your car work. I bet you believe your car works. You put petrol in it, and it, you know, it pistons go up and down, the thing runs along. We know how that works. It's the same science we use to understand climate change. And it's the science that's gone right back to Fourier in 1827, Tyndall in, 19, in 1850s, and Eunice Foote, there was a woman who did some work in the States, but because women couldn't publish, we didn't know much about her until more, more recently. So Eunice Foote in, the, in uh, 1847 or something, and then Arhenus, actually, who was uh, great Greta Thunberg's great grandfather, I think, did some work, yeah, some really important work in the 1890s. In 1912, the Daily Mail had an article to say that Bird keep on burning coal, we're going to see a lot more warming, it's going to be really problematic in 1912. The Daily Mail. The Daily Mail, yeah. Um, and so, actually, when you look at this, there's been a whole history of this, there's nothing new. Climate change is not new, it's just like the rest of science. It is science, it's just evolved. And, the, and the oil industry have tried to undermine that by pretending it's a special thing. It's not a special thing, it's just physics, chemistry and biology. That's mm -hmm. all it is. So a few years ago we had a talk series, some of you may remember, on renewables. Particularly we had solar, we had uh, nuclear, and we had all, all the, a variety, of, including carbon capture. Uh, it was first being discussed. And we're going to this is the first of a new series of talks that will be running at the Art Centre through 2022 in conjunction with West Kirby um, Transition Towns initiatives uh, on well-being. So look out for the posters that appear on the website and we'll be planning a few as, as, the, as time will come. But for tonight, thanks for coming over. It's a pleasure. We're going to treat you another beer.